What's up, you guys? Operation Gamer here. Hey, these ones go one, one floor at a time. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, um, just woke up from our nap. From our, you know, it's day, what's it, day three? I had a hard time sleeping last night. Same. I don't know why. Well, I have reasons, you don't. I do have reasons, too. Like what? I don't know, just couldn't sleep. <laughs> Yeah, well, I have legit no, 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 reasons. It was, uh, it was Aunt Wendy's phone just going off. Oh my god, yes, I heard that. I was just about to go to sleep, and then it went off like three times. Like, dude, dude, I was watching YouTube before I went to sleep. I was watching some YouTube before I went to sleep. I just kept hearing it going off and off and off. I'm like, stop playing words with friends. And like, uh, yes, we are eight stories up in this hotel. I would have thrown that thing out the window. Yeah, but anyway, so, um... But yeah, I have legit reasons. But um, anyway, so it's day three. Uh, what are we doing today? I know we're going to the Nutella. We're trying to go to the Nutella yes. restaurant today. Yeah, we're going to the Nutella oh, restaurant, really? and I think we're doing the architecture tour too. Depends on how much how uh, how much I film. Depends on if this vlog will be in two parts. Actually, the vlog yesterday, I'm surprised, was uh, was only like 25. It wasn't only like 23 minutes long. Well, considering some little editing that I did. But, um, yeah, so. Yeah, let's, did you upload that yet? Yeah, I, I uploaded that this morning. I, I, I filmed the day before, I edited it, I edited it uh, that night, and then I uploaded it in the morning. But anyway, I just like throw them together. But anyway, so we're gonna go to the lobby for a little bit, and then we're up. Uh, I'm gonna get out my. X cube mod that I just did. Yeah, he did some modding to his cube. But anyway, so I'm gonna, I'll turn off the camera and I'll pick it up when we. Uh, yeah. So guys, I sort of lied. We don't have time to do the uh, Nutella restaurant today. Dang it! <laughs> Sorry, Jace. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure it out. But oh crap. Anyway, we're heading to the pier, I think. Mom, we're heading to the pier, right? Here we're going to this architecture tour because of him. Me, I didn't, I didn't even know there was an architecture tour, so that wasn't me. I don't know. I'm just nothing. But anyway, so we're gonna head to the uh, pier, and uh, we'll see you guys there. Not that close to being done. Still, just why? Why not? Could be worse. Sure. As a link between the east and the west, a link between the Great Lakes, just over there, and the Mississippi. And they were right. So we began to form later on in 1833 into a township at Wolf Point with a population of roughly 150 up to 300 people. And by 1848, we had a population of 4,000 people. Already fast growing, even by that point. And that was the year we completed a linkage between the east and the west, a big canal called the Illinois and Michigan Canal, linking the south branch of the Chicago River all the way 92 miles to the Illinois River. Back. So the thing is, water routes were the only way people got around back then. That's the only way you really ship big things across the continent at that point in history. So we became the canvas to work with, a fresh canvas. And one of these architects was an engineer named William LeBaron Jenny, a Civil War bridge builder familiar with steel. In 1885, Jenny built the first steel framed skyscraper right here in the city of Chicago called the Home Insurance Building. Later demolished, unfortunately, in 1931 to make way for the field building. But that steel framing changed the game for architecture and architects because steel is about a third lighter than stone. So having a steel skeleton inside of a building meant for the first time architects could build higher and higher up. Orange, yellow cranes here with some banners on the outside, the same this up. They are building a new super tall skyscraper. They are called the Distant Towers. It's slated to be done in the year 2020, the earliest 2019. Once done, Vista Tower will be the new third tallest building in the skyline. 
The current third tallest we can actually see right now. If you look to the left, past those cranes, that taller mid-century modern building with the long, thin, vertical black stripes of windows running down that white granite facade. That's called the Aeon Center. Many people know this building already. The Aeon Center was completed in 1974 by the architect Edward Durrell Stone, along with a firm called Perkins & Will. Everybody, and I do mean everybody, called it Big Stan all the way back then, or Standard Oil Building. Many older Chicagoans still call it Big Stan, by the way. Big Stan, when originally built, was the tallest marble-clad building in the world. It was clad in a very beautiful, very expensive, white Carrera marble from Italy. The same quarry in Italy where Michelangelo got his marble from to sculpt many of his masterpieces with, like David. So as you can imagine, it's not cheap stuff, and it's incredibly beautiful. And a bunch of buildings. Does not make good cladding, though, for Midwestern skyscrapers. After just a couple of years of our winter cycles, that marble began to buckle and break on the outside. Cracks began to form all over every side of the building. Look at old photographs of what this looked like. So, by the mid-80s, pieces began to fall off the building. One hit a car parked nearby it. It was a bad day for someone back then in the 1980s. So starting in 1989, the building owners underwent one of the largest renovation projects in modern Chicago history. They spent $80 million to take off all that marble piece by piece and then reclad the entire building in North Carolina granite. The thing is, the building's cost of construction in 1974 went to the Chicago River in 1924. Imagine what this area was like back then. Rail yards, factories, warehouses used to line the area. The Wrigley Building really classed up Chicago in 1924. The building is clad in terracotta. There are 250,000 distinct terracotta tiles all on the outside. Terracotta means baked earth or baked clay. It's fireproof. Remember, we don't have the best luck there when it comes to fires. After 1871, with the Great Fire, we started using terracotta. Hey, like that to the outside of buildings. Hey, William Wrigley oversaw his construction for his chewing gum company. He originally sold baking soda soap door to door. It's hugely unpopular stuff, nobody bought it. So starting in 1892, he gave away two packages of his gum for free with every box of soap he sold. The gum took over. That's why we know about the gum today. The second tallest building in our skyline is coming off to right here, the Trump International Hotel and Tower, completed in the year 2009 by world-renowned architect Adrian Smith. Really? He is the same architect of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, the tallest building in the world today. Hey, this go. building rises 1,388 feet high. If you look up, you'll notice the setbacks in it. Those setbacks are meeting in other buildings. That first one meets the height of the Wrigley building behind it. The second setback meets the height of Mather Tower across the river, this inverted spyglass building just there. The third setback meets the height of the AMA Plaza building, this black building to its west formerly known as the IBM building by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, the father of mid-century modern architecture, just like this. Where the Trump building is today is where the old Chicago Sun-Times building used to be, a very low-rise kind of thing. It was demolished, they wait for the Trump, we'll see where they move to later on. Now moving forward, past the AMA Plaza, you'll notice we have purple veneer architecture. Now these two towers, many locals still call the Corn Cob Buildings. You can see why. These are called the Marina City Towers. They were completed in 1964 by an architect named Bertrand Goldberg. Right here, the overhanging eave at the top of the clock tower. The ornamental sheaves of wheat between the windows of the throwback to the Midwestern Prairie. This entire building is designed to hug the flat Midwestern Prairie landscape. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, made that famous, but he never called it the prairie style. Other people called it that for him, and he never really liked people calling it for him. Frank Lloyd Wright lived in Oak Park, Illinois, from 1889 to 1909. Make your way out there. You can check out many of his buildings today. This is a middle and a capital at the top, and that is called tripartite design. Base, shaft, and capital. Base, shaft, and capital are what always make up a Greek or Roman column, too. Dirt? If you read the letters at the top, D-I-R-T-T, -T, that stands for doing it right this time. Oh, doing it right this time. That's the make sustainable office interiors. They're all about sustainability. And the employees yes, call themselves dirt dirtbags, they have a sense of humor. Off to the right here, we have an enormous limestone-clad building called the Merchandise Mart. Completed in 1930, designed by Graham Anderson Probst and White. This is the next big style of architecture I'll mention a couple times today. Art Deco, kind of like which sleeve. flourished in the mid-1920s, dying out in the late 1930s. Yeah, Notice the green spandrels <laughs> between the windows. They act almost like pinstripes or racing stripes, taking your eyes up vertically to the top of the building. Where that prairie school stresses horizontality, Art Deco stresses verticality. It's taking your eyes up. 
Yeah. Notice the chevrons, often included with Art Deco, those arrows, the fluting columns as a pastiche of the old world being the new. Bronze medallions showcase all of this building, making glitter and shine. Where the river splits here. In 1833, the river was described as a wheat choke stream four feet across, two feet deep. Sorry. A lot wider, a lot deeper today than it was all the way back then. This construction happening off to your right there is going to be a new residential high-rise apartment building called Wolf Point East, slated to be done in the fall of 2019, designed by the firm Pelly Clark Pelly. It will complement the one already built. Uh, the far end, Wolf Point West, which you can see there, that opened up early last year, designed by BKL Architecture. By the way, BKL is pretty busy today. They just finished submitting a rendering to the city of Chicago for a new, very tall high-rise that will be built right on the lakefront as we'll pass by a little bit later in 2002. Lower the draw, right. By Greg DeStefano and partners. This Mom, is a condo lower the draw, you Until last year. Mom, with Wolf Point West it's like just completed. Oh, there's a lot of Oh, you should go to Spokane. So no, that is amusing to think about, but that's the thing. Chicago way. Again, Too we are the city on the make. So get a view that you love. The view might go away in a year or two. That's just kind of the way we're, we're building today. You play the gamble there. In the guard room. That's why Jeff uh, so we have a whole season dedicated to road construction. We need to figure out something. Huh? I know voice. He has to be quiet. That's here for some reason. Last year, it looks like it fits into 2016, doesn't it? This was actually built in 1983, which kind of shocked people all the way back then in 1983. It was a different style of architecture that they weren't familiar with yet. It's called postmodern contextualism, and all that means the building is built in context to the surrounding environment. Notice the green of the glass, how it matches the river, the ripple of the glass too, how it matches the waves on the river. The bend of the building matches where it is in a site-specific way to Wolf Point. When you compare that to the merchandise mark with that Art Deco, Art Deco period buildings are meant to stand out, be independent, be bold. This building is meant to fit in and flatter the surrounding landscape. They're bringing in the other buildings into it, meant to resemble the environment and flatter the environment. So we'll just talk about this as we see it in detail. But the building was built around a very narrow lot, just around active train lines that pass right behind it at ground level. Seven active train lines pass right behind the building. Support at the bottom. So the construction of 150 had to be done from a barge on the Chicago River for the last two years. They have some support on that side, but they need one on this side too. <laughs> they have also built a one and a half acre park around the building, along with a river walk. Chicago requires river you walks now, and new buildings are requiring building a river walk and plaza room and park um, space, so they have done all that here. That one and a half acre. Which is why they have <laughs> really been innovative in how they built here. The building space is only 30 feet across. It's only a fourth of the building's property. The building is core supported going all the way up. The offices are cantilevered, hanging 42 feet out from that central core support. This represents okay. the future of architecture in many ways. The future is about sustainability, like lead status, leadership in energy, and environmental design. The building here, this is the Boeing building. Off the right, the Boeing building was completed in 1990, designed by Perkins and Will, that same firm behind the Aon Center from before. The building was originally built for Morton Salt, the Salt Company. Morton Salt left the building in 1999, and later Boeing came I don't think after. there are. Morton Salt, by the way, is a Chicago institution since 1848. They were the first salt company to add magnesium carbonate to the salt, so it flows out easier, even in wet weather, which is why they have that slogan, when it rains it pours, which is a great slogan. The next six buildings on the right give us a timeline of how architecture evolved from the 1920s all the way to the 1980s. First, we have Art Deco, again, with this building, Two North Riverside Plaza, completed in 1929 by Hullabird and Root. Notice again the pinstripe windows taking your eyes up vertically to the top of the building. The repeated sharp cut machine setbacks, the entire building seems stamped by a machine itself. You notice Drink the obelisks water. in nice front, right very Egyptian in motif. I am. Because they had just discovered King Tut's tomb in 1922, and that became a key motif for architects of the Art Deco Street. Is Gateway Center 2, built 1968, both built by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, one of the largest architectural firms in the world today. 
Mies van der Rohe himself taught at a school called the Bauhaus School of Design in Germany in the early 1930s, where he told his students, less is more. We well, can see that there's a lot less going on on the outside of a Miesian modern building like this. It is stripped down of all that ornamentation and stonework of Beaux-Arts or Art Deco. It's extremely simple utilitarian, what many people call skin and bones architecture. It is this style of building. While there's less on the outside, there's more light and air on the inside, there's more plaza room at ground level. Purely modern, it drawn in. Less is more. Postmodernists said less is a bore. And they were bored because for more than 30 years, of all these stone boxes, they wanted things to be fun, expressive, and playful. Like those river cottages with that nautical thing. A little bit over the top is what you can think of as post modern in the world. There's a reason it was built so big. Notice the look of this building. It has seen better days. It was abandoned officially in 1996. The workers left to go to their new, more efficient post office building. Two, two, two streets place. down, past Harrison. Yeah. Just Harrison last year. It was built in 1986. And it was also a city within a city idea. That became a theme for him oftentimes. The building is shaped like one big S, if you look back from the top. And originally Goldberg asked the city's plan commission to approve a much bigger project. He wanted five more of these. That is pronounced Sears. <laughs> Call what you want, though. It's Willis in the guidebooks. We all know it as Willis. That's fine. Not out to confuse anyone, of course. But we still call it Sears. We're hung up on the name of Sears now. See, yeah, people probably agree with me on that, too. The Chicago Tribune had some fun with that. The day after that name change happened, they put out an edition of the newspaper, and the front cover was, What You Talking About, Willis? So they had fun with it, too. We'll talk about the Sears Tower detail coming up. That story about Kathy O'Leary and the cow and the lantern is not at all true. A local newspaper reporter named Michael Ahern wrote about a broken lantern on the ground. Everybody read that. They built it up as a bigger. Those were the first skyscrapers pioneered, really, originally in Buffalo, New York. We perfected that technology eventually. They traded agricultural commodities in the building, grain futures. They gambled on something of theme here that birds have a difficult time with skyscrapers, not only here in Chicago, but really around the world. Ahead of us here is Congress Parkway, a major expressway. Notice what this expressway does. It passes right through the heart of the old main post office. This is the reason this post office could not be demolished or abandoned in 1996. An expressway passes right through it as it began. It's an amazing piece of engineering. We'll see another amazing engineering project with the Boeing building off to the left. Notice the Boeing building coming up. You can read the logo at the bottom. When they were building the Boeing building in the late 1980s, they were trying to drive in columns beneath the south section we're looking at to support it over the railroad tracks that run underneath it. Unfortunately... So we just got off the uh, architectural tour about 15 minutes ago. How are you feeling, Jace? Was that, was that worth it? I'm dead. You're yeah, dead? That was good. Okay. Well, anyway, um, um, my mom and Aunt Wendy are getting... Uh, uh, food right now, and uh, we're pretty far down from where they are, so hopefully they'll be able to find us. Anyway, I'm gonna, um, just gonna cut this for now. Um, ho hopefully you guys enjoyed those little, little snippets of the tour. Uh, they were just, it was really interesting. I really liked it. I think it was, uh, beside it, besides it being hot as hell, I enjoyed it. Anyway, I'm gonna cut it on the camera for a little bit, probably play some 3DS. i get some more chicken, and then we'll, uh, see you guys in a little bit. We're inside the, uh, we're inside the, uh, Fisher Museum right now. Look at that. Look at that. That's all made out of Legos. The whole freaking city. It's crazy. I'm taking a picture of it. I'm taking a video. This has to be, like, an old one, because, like, I don't see the, uh, I don't see the uh, Hancock building anywhere. There's a lot of buildings I don't see on here. Interesting. Okay, I lied, they're not actually Legos, but it's still pretty cool. All the way back there, too. There's the river. Justin. Whoa. Hey, there's a train down there. Oh, they're all, they're all connected. The entire. Oh man, the drawbridge is opening up. I crossed the boat. We're gonna die. Oh, yeah, drawbridge, that's... that drawbridge. We're gonna die. The drawbridge yeah. opened up. We're gonna die. Oh my God. Hey. Is that not part of? 
Jace, Jace, it's getting hot. Look at that right there. Yeah, it was. Jace, Jace, look right there. Interesting. That's a tornado.
shameless self promotion. There we go. I, I, I did it, I did it, I did it, Jace. Jace, look. Jace, look. Perfect. Shameless self-promotion.